Victorians, uh, whether it's going live or not. What are we doing? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy, God. You know, lift these names up to you this morning in faith, God. We know that you can because we've seen you do it before in our lives. We're going to pray in faith that you will answer these prayers, Lord. But our faith is so grounded, God, that if you move in a different direction, that our faith will not waver. And we'll still worship you. We'll, we'll still be surrendered to you. So I lift up uh, this gentleman, Johnny, who's uh, struggling with cancer. My cousin, Jack, struggling with cancer. Liberty, struggling with cancer. Danny, Michael, em Emily, God, these ones we've set apart because they're dealing with one cancer or another, God. But we know that you are the original divine healer, God. I pray, God, that by faith you heal them as we pray for them this morning. Lift up our friend, Bob, to you, God, continue to strengthen him. Be with Joanne as she looks after Bob, God. Just help her in any way that, that you can. I'll lift up Dottie to you this morning. She's with us this morning, and Jamie and the kids as she's about to go to Miami. I pray for protection and safety, God. I pray for health. I pray for complete healing in all of their bodies, God. In faith this morning, we pray. I pray for William. I pray that uh, they can figure out the, a plan of attack for his illness, God, and may he be completely healed. I'll pray for uh, sweet Helena, God, just continue to be with her, strengthen her, help her, be with Heather and Chris as they look after her, be with the kids as they look after their, their sister. I'll lift up uh, Judy's mom to you, God. Um, got this request last week uh, for her health and her ability to travel from California to New, to New, New Smyrna. Uh, we just thank you, God. We know, God, that you hear us. We know that you understand us, that you'll meet us here in our desperation or our loneliness or our hopelessness. And we know that you can change that, that on a dime, God. You don't ask too much from us, Lord. You just ask for everything from us, everything, every, every inch of our being that we trust in you, even when the chips are down or when things aren't going the way that we thought that they were going to go, that you are still on the scene, that you are still in the mix, that you are still the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, and we're going to worship you until we either take our last breath or you grab us and take us off of this planet. So we thank you this morning. We thank you in Jesus' name. Um, also, there's, there's a couple needs in, in the church. If you feel led to give, you can put uh, on your, the envelope, or if you want to put in cash, you can grab one of those envelopes and drop it in the thing and just say benevolence. Uh, there's still some needs from, from different things going on in, in our fellowship. Um, we'll make sure that it gets in to the right hand. Uh, let's see, everybody got their Bibles? Let's get into God's Word. How are we doing on that feed? Welcome back. Cocktail. <clears throat> You're right, man. Uh, we'll be looking at Mark 14. Actually, it should say 1 through 11. Who made that background? Oh, I did. <laughs> Oops. Uh, originally, I was going to end at 9, and then it worked out better that we went through 11, and you'll see that as we, as we go through it. If you take notes, which I've urged you, implored you, beseeched you, encouraged you, didn't warn you, but to take notes, this one is tight, titled, Still. Go through, uh, it's pretty wild going through the Holy Week as we come approach Christmas. It's kind of wild how that, that, that God ordained that. So the death of Jesus Christ, this was on the screen when you walked in. 
uh, Oswald Chambers says, the death, the death of Jesus Christ is the fulfillment in history of the very mind and intent of God. And that's what we celebrate on Christmas morning, that Jesus Christ was sent, really born to die for our sins, to take our place. So you can see a manger there, and on the wall, it's not a very good picture, but there's the manger, and you see the cross on the wall. And that, to me, that depicts really what Christmas is all about. Every single moment, every single breath, every th single step that Jesus took, he was on his way to what? He was on his way to, to that cross at Calvary to die for our, our sins. And Mark 14, we'll jump into it. It was now two days before Passover in the festival of, of unleavened bread. The leading priests and the teachers of religious law were still looking for an opportunity to capture Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the Passover celebration, they agreed, or the people may riot. I mean, it's easy to get caught up. And we saw this with Revelation. We saw this in, in a few other areas of scripture, but especially in the Gospels, because the Gospels aren't necessarily in chronological order. So when you read one story and you read another gospel, it's like, well, wait a minute, that just does not fit, or that's taken out of con or that's not where it, it, it should be. And we're going to see that in the beginning this morning. But as we approach this final week, the Passion Week, don't get caught up in that because they're, they're all different. And we know that if you've been studying your Bible for any period of time, you know. And, and one of the main reasons is the days. No one can really accurately, well, this is what happened Monday. This is what happened Tuesday. This is what happened Wednesday. This is what happened Thursday. This is what happened Friday. You can sort of wrap your mind around the whole thing, but there's really no definitive, definitive way to do it because the Roman day begins when? This is Calvary Chapel, isn't it? We study the word. Hello. Midnight. The day, the Roman day begins at midnight. When does our day begin? Midnight. The Jewish new day begins when? Sun. So right there, you could be, well, five hours off if you're looking at it one way, or you could look at it where it's like, what, 16 or 17 hours off. So they're never going to properly line up. In Exodus chapter 12, you can look at the Lord's instructions about celebrating. And really, when I, when I think of the Passover and the, 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 unleavened, the festival of the unleavened bread and the seven days, I think it's about a celebrate, celebrate of trusting in him. Because that's what I do. I celebrate every day because I'm, I'm trusting in him. And, and it's to, to remind them the unleavened bread is, the festival of the unleavened bread is to remind them of, of what? Why, why did they do that? To remind them that he and he alone delivered them out of Egypt. The time of remembrance. And I think of it, and I, and I thought of it before, and I really thought about it when I was preparing this. It's almost like you could look at it, and I hope this isn't blasphemous to, to any Jewish people, but I look at like the Passover, and I look at this festival as like almost like in a way of like our communion now, because when we take communion, what do we do? We do two things. We examine our hearts, and then we remember everything that God has done for us. And it's weird, even in my life, when I see a rainbow, because most people, when they think of a rainbow, it's like, oh, God will never flood the earth again. I don't look at it like that. I look at it like, when I see a rainbow, I thank him for every promise that he has ever given me. I mean, I, I broaden the sense of the rainbow. And, you know, the rainbow now has been twisted and turned and stomped on and... and does anybody get up and leave? Last time I said that, somebody got up, got up and left. Mark, you're going to leave? Okay. <laughs> Call me later. <laughs> we'll go over a few things. But examine and remember. Passover to me, this is just me. It is the ultimate distinguishing. 
To me, that's when I think of Passover as a follower of Jesus Christ, I think of it as, a, as, a, as a, the ultimate distinguishing. Now, what does distinguishing mean? When you think of the Passover, what is the Passover? In, in Exodus 12, the, it was like, okay, we've warned you, Pharaoh, how many times now? I've warned you how many times now, and yet you're still disobedient. You still don't trust in me. You're still leading these people away. You're hurting people. And then finally said, here's the deal. The firstborn of everything is going to be dead. And then God told through Moses the people to put blood on their door so that he would pass over them. Distinguish is to classify. When I look at the Passover, I, I think of myself and you, that he has specified us to be set apart, to be passed over. We identify with Jesus Christ, do we not? We individualize with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ characterizes us as one of his. That's how he distinguishes us. Distinguish also means to be separated. Aren't we all called to be separated, set apart to do the good news, to do the good news of, of Jesus Christ? We have been divided. Man, is this country divided. But Jesus Christ, he sorts it out. He sorts it out. God told the, the Egyptians, you, your firstborn is going to die. But if you put blood signifying, not significant, significant, but signifying that you belong to me and I will pass over your house. So I will designate, I will recognize, I will distinguish that you are a part of my, me. I'll sort out, I'll sort into, I'll set apart, I will mark it off, I will select you. But I also love this, that distinguishes, draw the line. And that's what Jesus will do because some people think they live on this planet, many are going to church today, and they don't believe that God will ever draw the line. Here's the, if you cross this line, well, God's all about love. God receives everybody. Distinguishes to tell from. We, sh we should be in the stores, we should be in the workplace, and people should be able to tell us, that we're, tell from the way we act, the way we talk, the way we do this, that we're different. They should be able to tell that we're different from the person who did this last night, or the person who plans on doing this today. We, sh we should be set apart. I put pick and choose, that's one of the words, but also separate the wheat from the chaff or separate the sheep from the goats. All those things are distinguishing words. I see my life every day as a picture of Passover. I mean, for me to work, wake up each morning without guilt, shame, and condemnation, it's almost like the Lord just passed over my ugliness in the past and cleansed me on a daily basis. And it's just like, it's not once a year I'm going to celebrate this. I'm going to celebrate it every morning I wake up and he puts breath in my lungs. That he's given me another day to worship him. You know, like Yom Kippur. I, I don't have a problem with any of the, the rituals of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement or whatever. Or, or, or people going to church and putting ashes on their head. We should put ashes on our head every single day. Not physically, not physically, but internally. I, I worship you, God. I am sorry for the things that I did yesterday. Would you forgive me? Instead of, you know, making it known to everyone that you went to church twice a year or whatever the deal is. I don't, that, that's religion. We're followers. I, I like to follow Jesus. I don't know religion. What did R.E.M. say? Losing my religion? Anybody know that song? Oh, y'all know that one because you're Christians. Oh, it says religion in it. He was losing his religion. <laughs> my trust, my faith, your belief in him. It, it has set us free and ultimately is going to send us home. I mean, that, that's when I look at, look at this. I, I can't help to look at it that way. Maybe just because I'm getting older and I don't know. 
But when you go through this, I like looking at the whole picture. You can't look at like things in the Bible. It's just like and be narrow and try to focus. You can on some things. That, that's crystal clear. But I remember when we first got saved, we were sitting in Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale, and about 10 of us were sitting around with our lattes and all the other fancy. Well, that's when coffee drinks, fancy coffee drinks first came out. So we're sitting there with our fancy coffee drinks, and, and, the, and then we all went around the table. What did you get out of that message? And every single person had something different. And that's, when, that's the first time I realized that this stuff is real. How in the world could the same sentence mean something so differently and so life-changing for everybody? Because God's not going to speak to me about tr being an astronaut or being a farmer. I mean, you see we have no more live plants up here. I'm not a farmer. <laughs> we have some poinsettias. We're just counting the days when, they, <laughs> when they're hurting. But he's going to speak to you individually on what you need and, and when, when you need it. See, I look at the whole picture, the whole chasm of it. And then I want to look at the portion that's right in front of us. You know, we're going to look at Mark's account of the next few days in Christ's life here. But we're going to look at Luke and John and Matthews to pick up little details so you can understand it differently. And you will see that, wait a minute, that Mark doesn't put that there. John puts it over here and John does that. Gives us a, a better, clearer clear picture. And I love that. We were watching, we finally started watching The, the Chosen last night and we were uh, binging it for a little bit. But Jesus, when he first got on the scene, he was talking to, uh, no, he was talking to uh, Mary Magdalene and, and he said, well, you don't understand what's going on right now, but, but one day you'll see things more clear. And that just really struck me because we want all the answers. We want to be able to figure everything out. And he goes, hey, those things you're not going to understand right now, but one day you will un understand those things. I'll just give you a couple examples. I was out to lunch last week. Where is he? Where's Brian? There he is. I won't mention his name. <laughs> but being from California, when he was done eating, first of all, let me start here. When you used to play kickball, remember, or no, dodgeball, and when you threw the ball, and then if somebody caught it, what would you say? So they wouldn't keep hitting you, right? I'm out, I'm out, I'm out, I'm out. Well, for the first time in my life last week, this gentleman over here, I won't, I won't point it to who, but the waitress came up to him and, and she said, oh, you still working on your lunch? And he goes, I'm out. <laughs> And I'm like, you okay? He goes, yeah, I'm out. I'm like, what do you mean, man? Because I'm out. I'm done. I'm, oh, you're done. I'm out. In Philadelphia, there's a couple things that we do. One, I do not do. I've never done. And the second one, I, I, I plead guilty to it. But there's a word. Anybody from Philly in here or South Jersey? There's a word called... There's a word called John. It's J-A-W-N. And what does it mean? It basically means anything. <laughs> hey, I'm going to the game at the John. You can actually say, I'm going to go John at the John. <laughs> but the people who say it know what they're talking about. He knew he was out. He, he was like, I know what I'm talking about. There's another one, too, from Philadelphia. And, and, and like if I'm wearing an Eagle shirt or something, or, or not even an Eagle shirt, if they find out I'm from Philly, and at the end of the conversation, you, you, you don't even have to be talking about Eagle, the Eagles or football, but when you're leaving, they always say, hey, go birds. <laughs> we weren't even talking about football. It has nothing to do with football. It's just like, hey, how you doing? Go birds. Or they're walking by, hey, go birds. But you, only, if you, if you, only if you were from Philly or California would you know. Anybody ever hear I'm out before? Yeah. You have heard it, so I'm the only one? California. California? Do you guys know that? Yeah. I'm out? I'm out. 
All right. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. But I want to look at everything to understand things a, a little better. Passover was about to begin. I know I'm doing good when my wife's laughing at me. You're laughing with me, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> I deserve that one. I had that one. I did. How did I not see that coming? Wow. Tough crowd. But Passover was about to begin, and you knew that people would come in once a year, a couple times a year, and they would bring their sacrifices or they would bring their things to sell or, or pay temple tax or whatever it may be, but the, the crowds would be huge, at this time. So the Sanhedrin, the, the religious leaders are like, hey, let's get this plan together so we can get Jesus and we'll kill him. But let's not do it now because there's too many, too many what? Distinguished maybe? M maybe there's too many people who have been set apart or too many people that have come here to, to worship him. So we'll wait. We will wait. The Sanhedrin's plan was to wait. But don't we all know that God's plan waits for no one? I mean, think about it. it doesn't, if he's ready to do something, he's not going to wait for you to brush your teeth or sit down or, or do whatever. It, when he says it's time to go, it's, it's go time. Now, listen, I know that God show, show, has shown his patience, and I know he has with me, so that no one would perish. And thank God he didn't do that before I got saved. I mean, if I would have been God, I would have got rid of me in the 70s. And then if he had patience in the 70s, definitely in the 80s. And if he gave me patience in the 80s, then it was almost a done deal that he would eliminate me in the 90s. I mean, 25 years of, of in rebellion, and yet in his mercy and grace, he waited and he's waiting for all of us this morning. If you haven't given your life to Christ, he's waiting for you so that no one would be destroyed or no one would perish or that everyone would surrender to his son and be saved. Now, Matthew adds this in Matthew 26. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, remember last week they were on the top of the Mount of Olives and he was pointing out the olive trees and, and did, when all these things happened and, and the things start blooming. So when he got done speaking the Olivet Discourse, he said this to his disciples. As you know, Passover begins in two days and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. At that same time, the leading priests and elders were meeting at the residence of Cephas, the high priest plotting how to capture Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the Passover celebration, they agreed, or the people may riot. They're more worried about the people rioting than the person they were about to kill. So you see, you see God's plan. Jesus is up on the mountain telling his, his buddies, he's like, listen, in two days Passover begins, and I'm going to go to the cross. You know that, right? And they're probably like, what are you talking about? But I've told you, we've talked about this over and over again. But man's plan, and then you see man's plan. Man's plan, the Sanhedrin, the scribes, the leaders, the priests, they're like, hey, let's wait. But God's like, no, it, it's time. What's the opposite of I'm out? God's like, I'm in. It's time for the pause button of this time in history to begin right now. Because all, all during the time, Jesus would say, it's not my time. It's not my time. It's not my time. It's not my time. And now God's like, now it's the time. And then enter Judas. Enter Judas into the plot. We're going to see that next week in, in, at the end of today, that he was at the table. He was at his Thanksgiving dinner, dipping bread with them. So Judas goes into the plot. Because they were going to wait until after the celebration was over so there'd be less people. And then Judas said, hey, well, I'll help you out. And as we're about to see, no one really, really understood or comprehended the plight of the, the Lord's next few days, except for who? Can anybody tell me the one person that, that did? And there may have been a couple, but for sure we know that one did. It's a woman. 
Anybody named Mary in here? <laughs> Mark 14, 3. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon. Now, here's where, here's where the differing Gospels are, because the other Gospels don't read this way. The, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful, beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard. She broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. So she walks in and pours the perfume over Jesus' head. Now John adds this in chapter 12. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor, Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. See, I love Mary had the right posture here. She had the right posture. Actually, all of them, because I think sometimes we give Martha a bad shake on this. She was serving the dinner. And Lazarus, well, he just got raised from the dead a few days before that. And he was there enjoying dinner there also. But every single one of them was exactly where they needed to be at that moment. That's why I say it all the time here. You are not in this facility by accident. You're not watching this on TV by accident. God has something ordained for you to get or to receive this morning. Or maybe you're to be the receiver or the, the giver. There's no accidents. Actually, everybody was there where they needed to be, whether for good or bad, as Judas. See, the Messiah, what's another name for a Messiah? The anointed one. So the Messiah or the anointed one should be anointed, no? I mean, out of all the things on the planet, if you're going to anoint something or someone, it should be the Messiah. The Lord deserves our praise. The Lord deserves our exaltation towards him. Not just on Sunday or Wednesday night or when things are going bad and he comes through for you with a minute to go and you need, it's fourth and 18 and he throws a 19-yard bomb your way. But sometimes that's how we do it. It's like we wait until we score the touchdown and then we praise him and then we fall back in, into our same things. The Lord deserves our praise, our adoration. Messiah also means what? Messiah is the expected one. Think about that. They're, everyone is expecting him. The Jews today are expecting him. They're expecting the Messiah. They're expecting it. He's already been here. He's already signed, sealed, and one day he's going to deliver us back to, to the Father. But he's the expected one. I'm expecting this to happen. How could... How could how could anyone or how could so many miss this even today? Still. How can they still miss this? It's a done deal. Jesus in John 14 says what? He goes, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man can enter the kingdom without going through me. How do we know the way? How do, what do you mean the way? How do we know? How do we know God? And then Jesus is like, well, if you knew me, you'd know who God is, because him and I are the same. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Well, that's intolerant. Take it up with Jesus when you're standing over this judgment seat. Harsh? Sometimes truth can be harsh. If you don't receive it, it could be harsh. It could seem intolerant because you're not receiving it. From the very beginning, we're going to go, go to a gentleman's wedding next weekend, and he started hanging out with us after he was warned not to hang out with me and Tammy. 
Oh, you better not hang out with, oh, oh, why? What are they, they still into drugs? No, they're Jesus freaks. <laughs> and he disobeyed them and he got saved and the rest is history. He's marrying an awesome person next weekend. And I love it that Mary and Martha both witness their brother being raised. And you know, and you know the story. I, I wanted just to read the story because it cracks me up every, every single time I read it. Because they had faith, but they're like, hey, but if you would have been here. And Jesus is like, he's like taking his time. And he's getting there like a couple days later. You know, it's almost like, I, I want to make sure that he's really dead. Because if he's like still breathing a little bit, then this ain't going to work the way that God has this plan going here. I don't know what the deal was, but anyway. In John 11, we'll look a little bit of it in John 11. Jesus told her, speaking to Martha, your brother will rise again. Because when you say that to a non-believer, or you say that to someone, and then we'll look at Martha's response. Yes, Martha said, he'll rise when everyone else rises on the last day. He goes, you still don't understand what's happening here, do you? So she has faith, she knows the word, but she's like, yeah, I know he's going to rise when everybody else will rise. And then Jesus told her, and I love this, I am the resurrection and the life, Martha. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. That's why why it's such a, there's such a, a huge gap between when I do a, a memorial service for someone who dies that doesn't know Jesus or a celebration of life for someone who followed the Lord. It's night and day. It's darkness and light. Because if you believe in him, you will never, ever die. That takes away the sting of someone in the hospital. That takes away the sting of losing a loved one. I, I, I pray. I, here's my brother right here. It's just amazing just sitting there knowing that when he's passing away and taking his last breath, he's going to be in the presence of the Lord. I was still a mess. I love my brother. But you know what? I was a mess because I'm going to miss him. But I rejoice because he believed in God and he will never die. It's a beautiful thing. And then Jesus is like, do you believe that, Martha? I would have loved to have been at that conversation. We'd all be looking like, yes, Lord. She told him, I have always believed you are the Messiah, the expected one the anointed one, the son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. And then John eleven thirty eight, 38, Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb. I cut out the middle part. I cut out the middle man here. He wasn't angry at Martha. He wasn't angry at Mary. He wasn't angry at Lazarus. He was angry of how people were receiving a dead person because a person who is dead in Christ we just read he never dies. He will, he will live forever with the Lord. So it's just like you're buying the lie from Satan, and that's why Jesus was angry. You're buying the lie. He arrived at the tomb, a cave with, sto- a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he's been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. I'd be like, you ain't smelling so good either, Martha. (laughs) But the smell will be terrible. Right before this, she's like, oh, yes, I'm I'm on board. Yes, I'm on board. But he's, he's dead. Didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe, Martha? So they rolled the stone aside, and Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, Thank you for hearing me. I love that. Thank, he's always praying. Be a prayer. He, Jesus is always praying to the Father for his will to be done. Thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. His hands and feet were bound in grave clothes, his faith wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and and let him go, because he's out. I won't use that ever again. Remind me, second service, not to do that. 
I've always believed you're the son. I've always believed you're the one. But don't, but yo, don't go near my bro. He smells real bad. When I read that, I've read that a million times. When I read that, how many people have told people around me not to go around me for what I was doing? I wouldn't hang out with him. He's bad news. Yet Jesus broke through all of that, through, broke through all of my sin, all my addictions, and all of that. And he was there. He didn't care what I smelt like, what I looked like, how I talked, how I walked, how I lied, how I cheated, how I drank myself. I mean, all of those things. He was waiting for me to say, Lord, would you come into my life and help me? He smells real bad. So God doesn't work on the putrid? That's funny. Because he worked on me. I was more polluted than anyone that I know. Look, the Apostle Paul, I was, I was the, the greatest of all sinners. I was the, the, I was, they named sin after me. Listen, God can cut through our mess. I should wrap this, but I won't because I already blew with the I'm out thing. But God cut through our mess so we can confess and be blessed. Does that, should I wrap it? Yeah. I'll put it under the tree for Christmas. <laughs> but Martha, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if she did what? If she believed. Didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you gave everything you had? <clears throat> Didn't I tell you you'd see God's glory if you served turkeys at Thanksgiving dinner? Didn't I tell you that you would see God? No. <clears throat> Martha, I told you you'd see God's glory if you believe. Not if you see something. <clears throat> you see your brother in there dead, stinking. He saw an opportunity for people to believe. It's not if you see, but if you believe. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. That's like, an, that's like an expectation. The Messiah is what? I'm the expected one. So we're in faith. We expect things to happen. If we line up with God's will in our life, it's almost like, when is this going to happen? It gives us assurance about things that we cannot see. Hebrews 11.6. It's impossible to, to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe, the word again, must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. <clears throat> Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing. That is hearing the good news about Christ. As Bob Seeger said, turn the page. No one knows that song either. You want me to sing it? No. I believe that, and I told that story about, about sitting around that table when we first started going to Calvary Chapel in Fort Lauderdale. I, I believe that, that that's why God led me to that Calvary Chapel. There's a million churches. Anyone, I, I, if, like I've told you before, if Tammy said, well, I'm going to this church over here. If she would have said, I'm going to medieval basket weaving classes Sunday, I would be the most awesome medieval basket weaver that this nation has ever seen. I was following her, but little did I know I was following her as she was following Jesus. And I was led right to, and it was great because at Calvary Chapel, you're going to hear the truth. We're no better than anyone. Oh, you guys think you're better than anybody. No, we're just better off. We are better off because we know the truth, and we know that the truth will set you free. For if the Son of Man sets you free, you're what? You're free indeed. To hear the truth. To hear the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The Apostle Paul tells us this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven. And I love that. We should believe in these things. 
This isn't just, oh, what a great story. We, we need to pray into this and understand this and la- allow the Holy Spirit to allow you to understand what he is saying here. That when you die, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies, and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. I tell you, looking in that mirror every day, boy, I like, yeah, let me look at 1 Corinthians 5, 2 again. We grow weary in these bodies, for we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan. Anybody groan today? Oh, I do that at the house. Oh, you're right. And we sigh. But it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. God himself has prepared us for this. And as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. You need to be born again by the the Spirit to even come close to understanding what Paul is saying here. So we are always confident. What does always mean? Always. We are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not home with the Lord. For we live by believing and not by seeing. Yes, we are fully confident, and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then we will be at home with the Lord. So whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please him. Okay, well, we can't be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. We've all heard that before. So whether we're here or away, our goal is to please him. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Mark 14, 4 and 5, as we roll along here. Some of those at the table after Mary broke the jar, but some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume, they asked. It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. So they scalded her harshly. John adds this. In John chapter 12, 4 through 6. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, That perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold in the money given to the poor. And then John throws this little commentary in himself. Not that Judas cared for the poor. Oh, it should have been given to me, and I would distribute it to everyone in the neighborhood. Starting with me first, and whatever's left, well, there wouldn't be anything left, so carry on. But not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. So you see the whole picture. They're railing on Mary, and John's like, this dude's a thief. He, you do not receive anything that he is saying. But I love this. What was Mary's response to Judas? Does anybody know? I know what my response would be. I don't know if it would be breaking a deal of my salvation or not, but we worked that out later. What did she say? What did Mary say to Judas? Mary spoke volumes of her love for the Lord with her actions. What did she do? Nothing. You guys all know this. I have this on my wall. Somebody gave it to me. Preach the gospel at all, at all times. If necessary, use, wor- use words. That's what Mary was doing. I adore him. I'm, I've been expecting him. I'm going to anoint him because he's worthy to be anointed. And I'm on my knees. I'm worshiping him right now. And then she gets railed on and she said, and there's crickets. She was still. There's our other still. Still it's happening, but there's Mary. She was still. I mean, we, we can be in the presence of the Lord 
every single moment of every day and be still in his presence. She was noiseless. Well, she broke the jar all over the place, but, but then after that, May my words be few. That really spoke to me. We're going to sing this song in a couple of weeks, and I just love it. I'm not going to sing it because that would break up the flow of this plane landing, but you are God in heaven, and I am here on earth. That preaches right there. You are God in heaven. I am here on earth. So let my words be few. Jesus, I'm so in love with you, and I'll stand in awe of you. Yes, I'll stand in awe of you, and I'll let my words be few. Jesus, I am so in love with you. The simplest of all love songs I want to bring to you, so I'll let my words be few, because Jesus, I'm so in love with you. I mean, can it be any simpler than that? I would mentioned celebration of life's earlier, and I've used this in a few, few celebration of life's in Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. And then Psalm 46, 10 and 11. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Sometimes it's just shh. Sometimes we just got to shh. Just calm down. Take a few deep breaths. Ten if you're able without passing out. I've heard that. And refocus your energy on him. Refocus your energy on his promises to you. It's refocus. Uh, Mark 14, 6 through 9. But Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you. And you can help them whenever you want to but you will not always have me. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. 2,000 years later, we are remembering what she did and we are discussing what she has done. Thousands of years later. I dropped out of high school in my junior year of high school. Horrible. Didn't even make it to Christmas. My mom had no chance with me, so it wasn't like, you get back to school. She tried to do everything in her, in her own strength. She was a tough lady, but she was no match for the strength of the enemy. No match. She wasn't living, uh, living a godly life, but she had no strength because she was not living a godly life, so I, I was doing whatever I wanted to do. I went back and got my GD when I was 30 years old. Woohoo! <laughs> I was so proud, sitting in that room with 14-year-olds, and there I was, this old man with facial hair. And I knew everything. I knew everything because I just knew I knew everything, because I was a heathen. But my greatest education that I ever got is when my previous pastor came to me, and he allowed God to use me in listening to the poor and the needy that would come into that fellowship. They would come in. Our church was right off of 95, and there was hotels, and people were staying there, whatever, and, and we were a very easy thing to come into on a Sunday or Wednesday, and he put me, he asked me, would you like to, would you like to do that as part of, part of being an associate pastor? And I was like, okay, what do I got to do? He goes, well, that's that's up to you and the Lord. Because it was all about discerning the most godly action to take in every situation. It's still one of the hardest things 
for a pastor to do in a, in a fellowship. I don't care what they say. If they're in charge of doing that and, uh, and overseeing that, I learn more from God in those situations than any Ivy Ligger. Ivy Ligger? Ligger? L-I-G-G-E-R? Than any Ivy League student learned in their entire time in an Ivy League college. I learned more in those moments just ha trying to discern, trying to understand, trying to, to weed through the this, this stories. In the book of Acts, and this is very good for, for all of us, because Jesus said Mary did what she could do. And you put your name in that where Jesus put Mary. You do what you can do. Don't be around people like Judas that will say, oh, you should have done this, you could have done that, and you could, oh, and by the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw Jesus under the bus in about two days. You do what you can do. And I learned this from the very beginning. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently. They looked at him. They looked down and said, and then Peter said, look at us. Because he's like, hey, give me some. No, look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have. I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I do have. That changed my life, and it continues to change my life right now. Just like Jesus said to Mary, she did what she could do, and she did it. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up, and as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up stood on his feet, and began to walk. I don't hear him asking for money anymore, do you? I think that, that whole thing is gone now. Walking and leaping and praising God. He went into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in an amazement to Solomon's colony where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. See, this man, like so many people, was asking things from the wrong person. I get phone calls every week, and listen, I, we try to help as many people as we possibly can, but there's sometimes you just can't do it. Oh, well, you don't have the love of Christ. You don't have this. You don't do that. You don't do... I have phone calls every week. Are you the church that pays electric bills? <laughs> I pay mine. <laughs> Our church pays electric. Yeah, we, yeah, you're right. We do pay. Are you the church that... that is doing this or helping out with rent or doing that. I'm like, I, I think you have the, the wrong number. But I tell you what, silver and gold I, I may not have right now, but I think you need more than silver and gold. Let me share with you with what I do have for you. Click. They were asking the wrong, they, he was asking the wrong thing from the wrong people. God offered his son so that all of us, so that everyone could experience what the anointed one, what the expected one, what the Messiah offers. Don't rail on Mary. She did what she could do. Silver and gold we may not have, but I tell you what, let us freely share the word. Let us fr share the grace. Let us share the hope that we do have. Man, I'm going long, man. This is like longer than long. Anybody sleeping yet? Yeah? That was a rhetorical question. 
I'm landing the plane right now. Then Judas, I promise, here it comes, it's landing. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12 disciples, went to the leading priest to arrange to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted when they heard why he had come, and they promised to give him money, so he began looking for an opportunity to, to betray Jesus. You guys can come up if you want to close with some worship. They'll get me done. You put the pressure on. You hear me talk a lot about light and darkness. And I, and I think why Mark or Peter, whoever wrote the book of Mark, he put that story of the dinner where it was, because look at the contrast between Mary loving on Jesus and then Judas hating on Jesus. And you can see the contrast between unbelievable agape love and then unbelievable, horrible hate and the same thing. It's like light and dark. Mary's love compared to G Judas's hate, which was from money. Because the love of money can do what? It will pierce you with many arrows. So you see the darkness in Judas, but you also see the light going. It's so weird. It's like going to the cross, as we see this when Jesus is going to the cross. He's bringing all that love to the cross with him, but he's bringing all the darkness at the same time. Our sin, our sins were placed in his side. So it's the only time where you can read where, because darkness and light can't exist in the same heart. But for some reason, somehow Jesus could do it. He had all the love for us, but yet he had all the darkness from us with him also. It's bizarre. So you see it at the same moment. It's like light and darkness going down. Our rebellion. I'm not going to close with those other 45 scriptures, so we'll just move on. I, trust me, there was only a few hundred, but it wasn't. You got a problem with, I'll say this again, if you got a problem with me, take it up with God, because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made in his image. Some people just don't understand that. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your love, God. Lord, help us to be like Martha, serving you unconditionally. Help us to be like Mary, who's worshiping you, being in expectation of you. And help us to be like Lazarus, just, just sitting at the table with you. Everyone is welcome to that table. Everyone is welcome to that table of grace. Maybe you've never surrendered to Jesus Christ. Maybe you, you, your hope is what you're dealing with right now. Maybe your hope is in your job. Maybe your hope is in your family. Maybe your, your hope is in your wallet. Maybe your hope is in, this, in, in the stocks. I don't know, but place your hope in Jesus Christ. That's an eternal hope. That's one that will never leave you nor forsake you, never hurt you. one that will never allow the enemy to take your joy. Jesus Christ on that cross eliminated the power that Satan has over you. Now you can open up the door and you can hang out with Satan all you want, but that's your choice. Jesus has eliminated the power of sin in your life. And then three days later, he eliminated that awful fear of dying. As his resurrection signed, sealed, and one day will deliver us in resurrected bodies or raptured bodies, but will be in spirit in heaven. Come to him today. Come and just say, you know what? I'm sick and tired of playing games. I know I've fallen short. I know I've done things. I know I continue to do things I shouldn't do, yet I still do them. Why? I have no idea. This morning, I choose to follow you, Lord. Would you come into my life and, and help me? I need help, Lord. I've asked for help all around. But I choose you today to help me. Would you come into my life? First of all, forgive me for the things that I've done. Forgive me, God. I am sorry for those things. And you know what? I mean it this time. I'm sorry for the things that I've done in my life. Would you come into my life and cancel the debt that no man can pay? Heal me. Restore me. 
set me apart to do your kingdom business. I choose this morning to be born again of the Spirit, to start enjoying eternal life this morning. So we thank you, God. Thank you for meeting us here this morning, God. May you get all the praise and all the glory from everything that we do, everything that we say, every, every way that we respond to things. It's like, let my words be few. I just want to, I want to be still. I just want to just be still in your presence and, and, and just worship you for who you are and who you continue to be in my life. I take a deep breath and say, gosh, God, just help me. So we thank you, God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship the song.
Uh, thank you, Heavenly Father, for meeting us here this morning. I pray, God, as we go our separate ways now, God, that we may bless you with every part of our life, God. May you get all the praise, all the glory, for you are the King of kings. You are our Lord of lords. Uh, may we bless you as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. See you. Uh